Hello! Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to a Core Set 2020 draft guide. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about all things Core Set 2020 to get you ready for your first drafts. I've been talking about Core Set 2020 a lot with very skilled, limited players and been playing it quite a bit myself, and I wanted to share my experiences to get you guys ready for your first drafts. But before I begin, I do want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button to support the channel and the video, and subscribe to get updates whenever I post future videos, including Core Set 2020 drafts. But without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to start off with the color rankings. And at the top tier of colors, I have blue, green, and red. I think these colors are the best colors. They have a lot of synergies across them. Uh, they just have very powerful cards overall as well. Uh, red in particular has a lot of cards in it that work very well within red itself. Like the commons just synergize super well. And that's partly why red gets into this top tier for me. Even though its commons might be slightly worse in power level compared to blue and green. Next up, in the second tier, we have black. Black is definitely a great color in this format. It's like there it's not like a significant drop down from blue, red, and uh green when compared to black. I just think I'd rather be blue, red, or green or some combination of those than the black decks, though black is definitely a solid color and definitely a color that you can draft and uh you should draft if it is open. Finally, at the bottom of the pile, and it's actually significantly farther behind, we have white. White is a color that just lacks powerful comments. It lacks a lot of the cards that like the other colors have that make it quite good it doesn't have good late game value it doesn't have creatures that can push through damage early and a lot of the times it's going to be more of a support color than anything there are a couple of combinations that use white to good effect but overall a lot of the uh time in your draft if you have a choice between a white card and a card of any other color you're oftentimes going to try and avoid white if you do get a powerful rare to start with i still think it is worth playing white in your draft uh it's not completely unplayable uh but i would recommend against playing white if you have the choice for example if you have the choice between say pacifism and a uh rabbit bite pack one pick one two removal spells one of them is green, one of them is white. I would lean towards taking the rabbit bite just to avoid white. Uh, so that is kind of a thing that signifies white is significantly farther behind the other colors. This is based on results that I've had uh, playing with and against white, and both, and also a lot of discussions I've had with many other drafters playing with and against white. In the rest of this video, I'm going to be talking about the top five commons for each color, the archetypes, and how those ones rank up, and then finally going to be going over some tips and tricks for the format so that you can thrive in your own drafts. But So let's get into that. Going over the top five commons, to help out with this, you might want to have open Scryfall or uh, the card image gallery for Corset 2020 because I know that there is a lot of text. So if you are unfamiliar with the cards that I am talking about, uh, it would be really helpful if you could be looking at the card image. Uh, but I will be going over the top five commons for each color and briefly why they are the top five commons. And uh, yeah. First of all, we're going to look at white. I, my top five comments are Pacifism, Aerial Assault, Griffin Protector, Dawning Angel, and then Raise the Alarm. Uh, the Raise the Alarm has an asterisk because you only want Raise the Alarms in token decks. I don't think you just want to put it in any deck in this format just because the one ones don't really match up super well in uh, my experience. So I think you kind of want to build around Raise the Alarm if you are going to take it, but it is a very powerful effect, and it can kind of vary where you take it in the commons if you are going for token strategy. For example, if you are going tokens, you might take Raise the Alarm over Aerial Assault. But overall... If you are playing white, a lot of the time you're going to look to play it as a support color. Pacifism is a pretty strong removal spell, so that is definitely the premium common. Aerial Assault is another removal spell. It can take care of a creature of any size, which can be really useful. And a lot of the times you're going to be using white decks to pair with blue and play blue-white flyers or something like that. So Aerial Assault can actually gain you a couple of life on the way, so it's just a pretty solid removal spell. Griffin Protector I have at number three. This card just hits pretty hard. Um... Three mana for, I mean, four mana for a two, three flyer that then gets bigger as it attacks is pretty nice. It's also a decent combination with Raise the Alarm. And then Dawning Angel can just single handedly swing a race in your favor and just be a good flyer. So those are my top five commons for white. Moving over to blue, I have number one as Cloud Conceer. I actually think Cloud Conceer is arguably better than Murder, which is widely regarded as the best common in the set. Cloud Conceer is just super effective, and uh, two for one built into a creature is just very good. Definitely the top common. Winged Words as the number two common might be a bit controversial, but Winged Words has been excellent for me every time I've cast it. The format is slow enough that drawing two cards for one is very good, and a lot of the time you're going to have quite a bit of flying in your deck, so casting it for two mana is even better. So Winged Words has number two common in blue for me. Boreal Elemental at number three. Just a big flyer that's hard to interact with. Uh, a lot of the problems with a five mana flyer is that it'll die to a removal spell that potentially only costs your opponent two mana or even three mana. But if your opponent wants to murder a Boreal Elemental or use a Chandra's Outrage or something, it's going to cost them five or six mana. So you actually trade up on mana instead of down on mana, which is definitely a huge advantage. 
Number four, we have Frost Lynx. Frost Lynx is just very efficient, helps tap a creature, gets you good tempo. You generally want to be on the board before you play a Frost Lynx. You don't just want to be playing a Frost Lynx to tap a creature, though it can be effective to buy yourself time. Frost Lynx is just a great card. It is also an elemental, which is definitely powerful. Sleep Paralysis I have as the number five blue common. Uh, I think this one's kind of close with Unsummon, but I think Sleep Paralysis is a necessary card to have in your blue decks because you need to have some way to kill a threat. And even though Sleep Paralysis is slow, it's clunky, I think the first copy is actually quite valuable. I I tend to not run more than one copy of Sleep Paralysis, but I think that you uh, will take this over the first unsummon a lot of the time. Moving over to black, the obvious first uh, best common is Murder. Murder is an excellent card. Three mana just kills anything. Excellent card. I always take these cards pretty much when you see them. They're better than almost every common. Uh, it's kind of close with Cloud Concealer, but you're not going to always see those in the same pack. So it's really, yeah, Murder is a very good card, and you should be taking these early and often. Uh, yeah. Agonizing Siphon I have as number two. It's another good, solid black removal spell. Four mana to deal three damage might not seem like a ton, but in this format, what I have discovered is that a lot of the creatures are either two twos or three threes or like two one flyers or that type of thing. So three damage actually kills almost all of the threats you care about. Significantly, it doesn't kill Lavakin Brawler or like Silverback Shaman but, or like Mammoth Spider, but those are like, you can't kill literally every creature with your with your removal spell sometimes. And um uh, as the Agonizing Siphon kills like the vast majority of things I care about, kills all the flyers pretty much, so great card and uh, really effective. Audacious Thief I have is the number three black common, because in a lot, some decks, Audacious Thief can just run away with the game. If you can combine Audacious Thief with some interaction, for example, Audacious Thief into Agonizing Siphon, it can be very effective at just getting you extra value. Even if you just attack your Audacious Thief into another 2-2 and trade it off, you still uh, ended up up a card and your opponent ended up down a card. Sometimes in the late game, you can just suicide in your Audacious Thief to try and draw a removal spell you might need, so I really like Audacious Thief, and it definitely is terrifying to play against when your opponent has it. Definitely maybe keep back an extra blocker to stop Audacious Thief from going off, and look for combinations that involve Audacious Thief, for example, giving it unblockable, or things of that nature, or pump spells, or things like Blade Brand, which will make their agonizing Audacious Thief trade, even if they have a big creature. Number four, I have Gorging Vulture. This card is excellent. There are a lot of graveyard synergies in the set, in black in particular, and then uh, throughout the other colors as well. And Gorging Vulture sets all of those up. Um, it just, and also the life gain is relevant. Three mana, two, two flyer is relevant. Just a great card overall, and one that I'm happy to play in all my black decks. Soul Salvage, I have an asterisk on this one, because the first, asterisk, sorry, because the first copy of it is very, very, uh, I think, important for black decks. It really helps them grind out value. But I think after that, you would take other things. There's a lot of black commons that are much better as one ofs. Bone Splinters, Sanitarium Skeleton, and Soul Salvage all come to mind with that. So I think after the first Soul Salvage, you kind of look to take other things. But I think the first copy is very important. Go Moving over to Red. Red has a lot of great commons. Uh, number one is Chandra's Outrage. I think the four damage from it just pretty much kills every single like card you care about in the set. So it's just a very potent removal spell with an extra two damage tacked on. Next up, I have Shock. Shock is just premium, cheap interaction, and I really do like Shock. Uh, Shock versus Chandra's Outrage is uh, pretty close, in my opinion, as well. Number three, I have Lavakin Brawler. This might come as a bit of a surprise, because Lavakin Brawler does not immediately appear to be super powerful. Four mana for a two, four, you're like, eh, that's not that great. But I have found Lavakin Brawler to be excellent. It is a great combination with Goblin Smuggler. It attacks oftentimes for 4 or 5 damage, and it also just blanks the attacks of a lot of your opponent's creatures. As I said earlier, there are a lot of 2 2s and 3 3s running around, and when you play a 2 4, not only can your opponent not attack you, but when you attack them, they have to throw a, a double block to trade with it. So, Lavakin Brawler does offense and defense quite well. Number 4, Red Common, I have Pack Mastiff. Just a nice 2 drop. It, it has relevance in the late game, and uh, that's really nice for me. It also combos with Goblin Smuggler pretty well in addition to all of that. F number five red common is Chandra's Embercat. This card is a little bit, it will change which red common you would rather have in this spot, depending on your situation. For example, Destructive Digger, the first copy of that is a pretty high priority for me. The a couple of Goblin Smugglers, if you have some Lavakin Brawlers or Pack Mastiffs are also pretty important. But Chandra's Embercat, the fact that it combines really well with Lavakin Brawler, the fact to get it out a turn early, it combines with a lot of the other elementals. If you have Chandra's Embercat tapping to cast like say, like, six or seven cards in your deck, then it just becomes a very potent card and one that can be a real good threat uh, on turn two. Two mana two twos don't always need a lot of extra stuff to become good, and tapping for mana every once in a while is quite nice. And the curve of Chandra's Embercat into Lavakin Brawler is terrifying for opponents uh, because then you have a 4-4 four, four attacking on turn four. Uh, moving on to green. Green's commons are also very powerful, and looking at the top three of them, they are very close. I, number one, I have Rabid Bite. This is going to be because in this format, a lot of the things you need to be prioritizing are removal spells at common, because there aren't a ton of uncommon removal spells, and so using your 
uh, early picks to get some removal is really important. If you can end up with three or four removal spells in your deck, you're going to have a pretty nice way to deal with a lot of the problematic cards your opponent might play, but there is not all that much removal out in the set. You're going to have to take the commons pretty aggressively, and uh, Rabbit Bite is just really kind of irreplaceable for green decks a lot of the time. So that's why I have it at the number one common, even though it might not seem like the most objectively powerful. Leafkin Druid is an excellent uh, number two green common. It's an elemental, which is actually quite relevant for a lot of synergies. For example, if you use it to ramp out a Lavakin Brawler. Uh, and also just the fact that it can tap for two mana in the late game is quite relevant as well. So Leafkin Druid is definitely a card that uh, I think is very powerful and one that you should be taking early. Silverback Shaman is a green common that I've always kind of just been like, wow, this card is insane. Uh, 5 mana for a 5-4 trample that can also draw a card when it dies is just excellent. So, uh, pretty easy to put that among the top green commons. The reason it's not higher is because 5 drops are relatively replaceable. The difference between a Silverback Shaman and a Fire Elemental, which is just a 5 mana 5-4 Elemental, is like, Silverback Shaman's clearly significantly better, but you can get Fire Elementals later, whereas you can't get Rabid Bite replacement effects later. You can't get Leaf Kindred replacement effects later. Uh, and you can get a big clunky guy to fill a Silverback Shaman's role later, which is why I have it as only number three, but that's still quite good. Good high ranking. Uh, number four, I have Netcaster Spider. This card is very good in the format. There's a lot of flying run running around. It's one of the supported themes, and Netcaster Spider really dominates the flying strategies. There's a lot of 2-2 two -two flyers, a lot of 2-1 flyers, um, and uh, even some 1-1 one -one flyers running around. And Netcaster Spider blanks all those for a low cost of three mana, and even if your opponent has a bigger flyer, like an Air Elemental, your Netcaster Spider will trade with that as well. So Netcaster Spider is definitely a potent card, and one that I look to prioritize and have a copy or two in my, all of my green decks. Number five, green common, was really tricky for me. There's a lot of really close options, uh, but I settled on Thicket Crasher. It's just really got some good synergy with your uh, with the Elementals that you can be running. It's also got just good stats. Four mana, four, three tramples, pretty good. Uh, in certain decks, you'll want to prioritize other things. Gift of Paradise is a card that certain decks will want a lot more, and if, especially if you're splashing, you'll take that over Thicket Crashers a lot of the time. But I just, in a straight, and also Mammoth Spider is a card that you'll oftentimes want in your green decks if you can't get any Netcaster Spiders. Though Netcaster Spider and Mammoth Spider are a good combination together to just completely stonewall the ground. So those are my top green comments. Hopefully, if you uh, had the card gallery up, you can know what those did, or maybe you just knew what the cards did anyway. But hopefully, uh, yeah. You know what most of those cards do, uh, because they are quite good, and you should be playing them. Next up, I'm going to cover the archetypes and go through the top-tier archetypes, the mid-tier archetypes, and the low-tier archetypes in the format. I think you can play any archetype, but I think you should generally try to avoid the low-tier archetypes when you can, because I just don't think they have enough support, and they do, you might have guessed it, feature white, which is kind of a weak color. So if you're like the only white drafter, I think they can sometimes get there, but a lot of the time you'll want them white to be a support color, and uh, yeah. These are the, those are just the decks that I have not really seen around or seen having much success. In the top tier, I have blue-green value, blue-black control, teamer elementals, and green-black value. So blue-green value essentially is just like exactly what it sounds like. A lot of the time, it'll feature Risen Reefs and Cloudkin Seers and just a lot of creatures that are good. There's just very good commons across, and like Silverback Shamans, there's a lot of really good commons across blue and green, and uh, you can just combine them into a deck and get a lot of value. And... Uh, one loop you should be looking for, I'll cover in the combo section, um, is potentially in a blue-green value deck, Scholar of Ages and Pulse of Marasa to just get you a lot of late game, um, like life gain and things like that. You can like and like late, lots of late game value because you can essentially infinitely loop them. Uh, blue and green, any any combination of the Soltai colors is generally going to be a pretty good late game deck, and late game decks in this format are quite strong. Uh, blue black control, pretty much just what it sounds like, very powerful. There's a lot of just good blue and black cards. Murder isn't common. Um, blue just has a lot of good card advantage engines and just a very solid deck overall. Um, Teamer Elementals is a deck I've had great success with. Uh, a lot of the time, you'll play this deck if you get a Risen Reef. That's really where you'll, Risen Reef will find its great home, because Risen Reef into Scampering Scorcher just wins you the game on the spot a lot of the time. So that's generally when you'll want to play Teamer Elementals, or you'll get an Omnath, or you just have some commons that really synergize well, and you end up like with a couple Cloudkin Seers, a couple Flamekin, uh, Brawlers, and then you end up wanting to splash uh, green, or you end up green red wanting to splash some Cloudkins, and generally just a pretty solid combination. A lot of good cards going on there, and a lot of synergy. Next up, green black value. This card, this is just another great value deck, and uh, you can oftentimes leverage Moldervine Reclamation and that type of thing to. Uh, yeah, just crush your opponents in the late game. All of those decks have in common that they're going to be pretty solid in the late game. Team Elementals uh, sometimes won't be as good in the late game, depending on what you have, but it is still a very potent combination. In the mid-tier, I have Red-Blue Midrange. This just has a lot of solid cards in it. Uh, the red commons just 
like Chandra's Outrage and Shock are just quite good. The blue cards like Cloud Concealer and Frostlings and stuff are just quite good, and you combine them. You get some flying synergies, some elemental synergies. Overall, just an archetype that's pretty solid. Red green elementals, I've had decent success with. It hasn't been like complete dominance, like some of the top tier decks, but uh, generally this is where you end up if you're just playing some elementals and just playing some. Sometimes you can turn this into a bit of a ramp deck where you play like some Gifts of Paradise and play some more expensive cards. But uh, red green is also, yeah, just a good color for splashing because of the presence of Avaricious Dragon and uh, Gifts of Paradise in these colors, so they can help you splash as well. But red green elementals, red green mid range, sometimes red green ramp, just a pretty good color combination and uh, one that you can be pretty flexible actually, which is kind of nice. Another deck I have in the mid tier is a blue white flyers. I think blue white flyers is a uh, pretty a uh, good deck in the format. There's a lot of fl support for flying. If you have an Empyrean Eagle, it it becomes like disgustingly powerful. There's also just Winged Words, Warden of Evil's Isle, a lot of payoffs for flyers, um, and blue-white leverages them pretty well, because the white cards, a couple of the flyers in white are actually pretty good, so you're just picking and choosing the white cards that you need for the deck. A lot of the time you're going to be heavy blue if you do play blue-white flyers, but the deck can be quite potent, and uh, definitely one that you should be aware of, and uh, that's part of why Netcaster Spider is so good, because you need to be able to stop decks like blue-white flyers. Mono Red Aggro is a deck you might not expect to see here, but this just leverages the fact that there are a lot of cross synergies between the red commons. You don't even need like a lot of like any uncommons or rares for this deck to be good. You can just play stuff like I mean obviously it's better with uncommons but and rares, but uh you can just be playing a lot of the red commons and they'll just work well together. So um I think Mono Red Aggro is the type of deck that um yeah can definitely catch you by surprise. You don't necessarily expect a monocolored deck to be super powerful. But just the combination of like Goblin Smuggler plus Lavakin Brawler plus Chandra's Embercat ramping things, plus the the Pack Mastiff. Just a lot of the cards just work really well together. And uh, even Scorch Spitter can do a lot of good work in this type of deck. Um, so I think Mono Red Aggro is a legitimate deck. I've gotten to play with it. I've seen a lot of other people playing it. It's a little bit less known, so maybe you can wreck your own draft with Mono Red Aggro and nobody will see it coming. Uh, especially because, as I was saying, the top tier decks are all very slow. So Mono Red Aggro can get underneath them, kill your opponent dead. It has a decent amount of reach and really does good work. Next up, black-red mid-range. There's a lot of cool combinations in black-red. There's just a ton of removal because black has three removal spells at common. Red has two removal spells. Actually, three removal spells at common as well. Um, yeah, I wasn't thinking of... Yeah. What, yeah, we, black, They both have three re removal spells at common, so there's just a lot of removal. There's a lot of grindy elements. You can play some Audacious Thieves. Audacious, yeah, Audacious Thieves to get some value. You can play some Gorging Vultures and Soul Salvages to get some grindy value. Just a lot of powerful things to do in black red mid-range, and I think it's a good deck. Green-white tokens, I put an asterisk, because I think this deck is a bit tricky to draft. It's uh, also a little bit hard, because sometimes, if, if the right cards are not opened, and you don't see the right cards, it can definitely fall a bit short. But I think this is definitely a uh, deck that has a lot of potential, and definitely someone that can win games. Uh, you're looking for things like Raise the Alarm, Overrun, uh, there's an Uncommon Iron Root Warlord, uh, that is very good in this type of deck, and overall you're just looking to kind of flood the board and then attack your opponent and get a big inspired charge turn or a big overrun turn, and that's pretty much how you're going to win the game. You, it, I put the asterisk because you can't always get all the pieces for it, and it's kind of hard to draft sometimes because it's not the most straightforward deck, and you can't just rely on getting good white cards and good green cards and just having a kind of sub-theme. I think you kind of have to go all out and uh, get a good deck uh, that, yeah reliably can get tokens and go wide and stuff like that. In the low tier, I have black-white aggro and red-white aggro. They just don't really have enough, like, good synergies. The white cards just aren't good enough to hold their own, and even the, like, you can have, like, if, if you're going to have a good red-white aggro deck, it's going to be mostly red cards, I think, and if you're going to have a black-white aggro deck or a black-white mid-range deck, you're just kind of be, I think, I think black-white, I just said black-white aggro because, like, I feel like that's kind of what the supported archetype is with the the white black card uncommon, but I think that black white can just be like a mid range deck that lightly dabbles into white. I just don't think black white's a great color combination though. And finally, moving on to the tips and tricks section, there are a lot of things to look at here. Combos to be first off, I'm going to cover the combos that are just really potent. There's some most these are all feature commons and uncommons. You can assemble these in your drafts and they are very potent. Um, I'm not featuring any rares here, but there are a decent number of combos involving rares, obviously. And then I'm going to talk about the cards to be careful of, and then great one-ofs. Cards that you really want one copy of in your decks, but after that, they drop off in value. So first off, the combos. Goblin Smuggler plus Lavakin Brawler is a really nice combo, because you can give it unblockable, and then attack them, and then the Lavakin Brawler gets the bonus for its attacking. That's a nice little 3 damage combo, and if you have any other elementals, it can be 4, 5, or even 6 damage. Another cool combination, if you're playing Black Red, is Goblin Smuggler plus Audacious Thief. Just build yourself a draw an extra card every turn, because you can give the Audacious 
Spacious Thief Unblockable, and then draw that extra card. This next one is a combination that you really need to be aware of. If you get a Scholar of Ages, be sure to look for Soul Salvage, Pulse of Marasa, or Blood for Bones to essentially go infinite with your Scholar of Ages. The way it works is you play your Scholar, uh, get back two cards, say a Soul Salvage and a Removal Spell, then your Scholar dies, you play Soul Salvage, get back Scholar and another creature, and then you play your Scholar again, get back Soul Salvage and another. It's just an infinite loop. Pulse of Morass, a similar thing. You're getting slightly less cards because the Scholar, you're only getting the extra instant or sorcery. You're not getting an extra creature the way you get with Soul Salvage, uh, but still a very good loop. And then Blood for Bones, you sa you can like sacrifice the Scholar, return the Scholar. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think you can do that. And then, uh, yeah, you, you can do that if I remember the cards correctly. Um, you can like sacrifice the Scholar to return the Scholar and then get back you don't actually want you want to sacrifice the scholar, return the scholar to your hand, and then play the scholar again to get blood for bones, because otherwise the blood for bones won't be in your graveyard when you return scholar. But essentially, you infinitely loop the scholar of ages with those cards, and it's a very potent combo. Risen Reef plus Scampering Scorcher. One of the best reasons to be team or elementals is if you have those two cards, or you get a Risen Reef and see a Scampering Scorcher. Just very potent and uh, kind of wins you the game on its own. It just draws you three cards or ramps you three times. Or just very good. Uh, Active Treason is a card in this set that can be very good for you, and combinations with Active Treason that are at common are M Mask of Immolation. That just is mono-red. You can play a couple Mask of Immolations, because Mask of Immolation is a good card, and then just throw an Active Treason in there and randomly get 5 mana to kill their creature and get in some extra damage, which is quite good. Another combo with Active Treason is Bone Splinters. That's another good card uh, to combo with it. Take their creature, kill another one of their creatures. Just good value. Turn Active Treason into damage, plus a kill spell. And then finally, Blood Soaked Altar. Bloodsoaked Altar does have a lot of costs attached to it, but if you can active trees in their creature, sacrifice that creature, in addition to your other things, you're going to be getting some value out of that as well. So if you have some sacrifice outlets, look for active treason. Finally, uh, a couple, last couple of combos. Sanitarium Skeleton plus Bone Splinters. Um, it's just a nice combination. You are not really losing a creature because you can get the Sanitarium Skeleton back. And Sanitarium Skeleton plus Blood Soaked Altar, you can use it as a card to discard, or you can use it as a card to sacrifice. So it's really a nice combination there. And then the last combo I want to mention is Scorch Spitter plus Chandra Spitfire. I think Scorch Spitter is a little bit more playable than it looks. I initially was like, wow, this card is terrible. But then I saw people posting results with the card, and then I tried it out myself, and the card actually performed decently well. And if you have a Chandra Spitfire, Scorch Spitter can do good work. I think Scorch Spitter is the type of card you really only want to play in like an all-in aggressive deck, like the mono red aggro deck. But in that deck, it can give you some nice reach. It can be like just a good card with the Spitfire to if you have some Spitfires to give it like plus three attack, because that plus three attack is really quite good on the Spitfire. So if you have something like a Goblin Smuggler, a Scorch Spitter, and a Spitfire, you can hit them for like six damage a turn, which is just really, really good. Um, moving on, I mean, those are just some of the great, com biggest, best comments. The cards you need to be careful of. Uh, first up, we have Blade Brand, and in, a, in the same vein, Fathom Fleet Cutthroat. If your opponent makes a weird attack with a black creature, and you're think in, in a black deck, and you're like, huh, what could they have? The first cards you should think about are Blade Brand and Fathom Fleet Cutthroat. How bad would it be for you if they had Blade Brand or Fathom Fleet Cutthroat? If they're attacking their 1-1 in, and you're like... Well, I could block with my 5-5. Five five. Maybe consider not doing that so you don't get wrecked by these cards. Um, if you play around them, they become much worse. Specifically, Blade Brand. Try to get your opponent to use Blade Brand on defense and then blow them out with your own combat trick. And then try to get your opponent to just play Fathom Fleet Cutthroat as just a vanilla 4-mana 3-3 three, three Hill Giant. Um, but yeah, those are cards to be careful of if your opponent makes a weird attack. Overcome is a card to be wary of. If the game starts to grind out and you're like thinking, oh, I can just sit back and relax. Remember, your opponent could have Overcome in their deck, and that can vastly change the way the board looks. If they have a bunch of like two twos, just if they have like six creatures and they cast an Overcome, they're just going to win that game a lot of the time because they're adding 12 power and 12 toughness and attacking with Tramble with their entire team. And uh, so if you have like a flyer, try to chip in, get the game over because Overcome can definitely end it. Flame Sweep, another card to be aware of. If your opponent's like setting up a board, making some weird attacks, some weird trades, be wary of Flame Sweep because it could definitely ruin your day. In Inspired Charge is another one. Your opponent attacks all out with their board of 1-1s, one and you're like, what could they have? Inspired Charge should come to mind. Um, definitely one that can uh, ruin your day. You can turn turn a game that you were winning into a game that you just lose if you block incorrectly, so be aware of Inspired Charge, a card that the tokens decks will often want to play. Fail Invocation is another card to be careful of. A lot of combat tricks are going to trade for your creature one for one, so like they'll pump their creature, you'll lose your... You'll, they'll pump their creature, you lose your guy, it's like they traded their combat trick for your creature. If they can Feral Invocation, they are left behind with a massive threat, so that's even better for them. It's like a 1.5 for one instead of just a 1 for one. So beware of Feral Invocation, maybe throw an extra couple creatures in the way, uh, but 
you really don't want to get wrecked by Feral Invocation. And also, if you have a damage-based removal spell and your opponent's holding up three mana, consider waiting, because if they you go for a removal spell and they Feral Invocation, that's also uh, a kind of catastrophe for you. So be aware of Feral Invocation and try to play around it if you can. And finally, Uncaged Fury, especially combined with other combat tricks. If your opponent makes a weird attack and you're like, wow, why would they attack their 1-1 into me when I'm at 12 life? And then they just go um, Infuriate, Uncaged Fury, give it plus 4, plus 3, and double strike because of the combination of those tricks. And uh, it was a 2-2 before, and now it hits you for 12, and you just lose the game. So uh, be aware of that type of combination. Uncaged Fury is definitely something that can end the game out of nowhere, and if you can play around it, you should. And then finally, the great one-ofs that I really like having one copy of in my deck. I'll go after these one-ofs aggressively, but after that, I don't really like having too many of them. First off, there's Unsummon. Unsummon is just premium interaction. One-mana interaction is just really good. There's a lot of things you can do with Unsummon. You can bounce your own creature in response to removal, bounce their creature in response to a combat trick, bounce... You can also loop... Oh, I forgot to say this. You can loop Scholar of Ages with an Unsummon uh, because you can just Unsummon your own Scholar of Ages. This is less reliable because they can kill their scho your Scholar of Ages in response, but Unsummon plus Scholar of Ages is also a loop. I'm sorry if I... Oh, man, I, I messed up the graphic, I guess, but... Unsummon plus Scholar of Ages is the way it works. You play Scholar of Ages, get back Unsummon and something else, then you bounce your own Scholar of Ages, and then you, you repeat that loop. But Unsummon's a great one of because uh, it's kind of hard to play around all the time, but after a certain point, it's kind of hard to find ways to get a card's worth of value out of an unsummon. So the first copy is one I really high pri will prioritize. I will probably play two copies, but I don't really pursue them. Like, I don't draft them very highly after the first one. Sanitarium Skeleton is a card that if you have synergies with it, like if you have a um, Bone Splinters, if you have something like a Blood Soaked Altar or just a lot of, like, even just some self-mill sometimes. Sanitarium Skeleton is a card that having one copy of can drastically increase the power of your deck, but the second copy is much worse, because then you just can't really afford to be spending all of that mana on just Sanitarium Skeleton. So the first copy is one you'll prioritize, and then after that it falls off, and you don't really want as many. Next up, Soul Salvage, great one of. It's the type of card that, if you draw it in your opening hand, it can be really clunky, so you don't really want multiple copies of it, because in you know, there will be games where you draw two soul salvage early and then you just don't have any creatures in the graveyard and then you just lose those games before you can get any value out of them so i think one copy is the sweet spot on soul salvage and uh definitely a card that the first copy is pretty good destructive digger was a card that really surprised me but it's now a card that i actively want as a one of in all of my red decks just getting rid of lands in the late game is really powerful to draw extra cards and uh having one copy is just really good in your red deck. So just look at, look for Destructive Diggers. Uh, they do get a little bit worse in multiples, obviously, because you can't just sacrifice all your lands. But the first copy is quite good. Brightwood Tracker is another great one of. It just is a great way to find some fuel in the late game with a relatively low cost of putting a 2-4 in your deck. The thing with... I don't like playing multiple Brightwood Trackers, but I think one copy in most green decks is going to be pretty good because green decks tend to get to the late game pretty well because of the spider package. Netcaster and Mammoth Spider just stall the game so well. And then Brightwood Tracker can help you pull ahead. Uh, and then some sideboard cards that I love having at least one copy of in the sideboard, Plummet and Heart Piercer Bow. I think having access to those in the sideboard can greatly increase your win percentage in a lot of the matchups. Heart Piercer Bow can just ping a lot of the creatures and just certain decks just really struggle against the one damage effects. And then Plummet is just really good against just any Flyers deck. So aggressively go after those cards for your sideboard and you really want to have at least one copy of each of those in your sideboard. That is going to do it for the video, though. I really do hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy this draft guide, be sure to let me know by leaving a comment in the comment section down below. Hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. Let me know if there's any cards or combos or things that you would like me to talk about in more detail. I gr really do hope you enjoyed this video, and I will talk to you next time.